Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we welcome a special guest who's been working on Holochain for five years. So welcome to the channel, Matthew. Thanks for having me. Well, we're going to get into some tough questions today from the crowd, as well as the history of Holochain, its point of differences, and for those that haven't really followed Holochain, in a nutshell, what is it setting out to do? Sure, we'll start there. So Holochain is a framework for building peer-to-peer -peer applications, meaning applications that run on just the devices of the users themselves, their laptops, their phones, etc. Yeah. What that means is that there's no corporation that needs to be in the middle running a web server in order for you to run something akin to an Uber or a Facebook or Airbnb or any other app. So just one of the things you've touched on there already, which is great, let's get into it. With these other consensus mechanisms like Ethereum, every node has to uh, validate every transaction and the state of the network. Uh, this can be pretty cumbersome. That's why we're slow on working on scaling. So why did you say that each device has its own, I guess, consensus? It's actually not consensus. Okay. So we, we don't use consensus. We're not doing global consensus. That's one of the main points of differentiation. We were not a way of coming up with a single perspective yeah. for an entire community, which is what you can think of global consensus as. Yeah. Our focus wasn't that. It was enabling communities to run applications as communities without having any central points of control or failure. Um, we didn't want to have a company in the middle. We also didn't want to have a subgroup in the middle. All of the major blockchains have miners who are sort of like elite citizens, right? Yeah. They, they have rights and, and capacities that nobody else has. The, I think of blockchains, any, any chain that is trying to do a global consensus, um, I think of those as actually a centralizing technology. It's centralizing at a different layer. It's not that they're all, it's not that the application is running on a single machine, but it's that every single participant ends up having to come to a single perspective about history. Yeah. That's the reason why these uh, other blockchains are struggling so much in terms of scale, speed, cost, et cetera. Um, we weren't trying to solve that same problem. And so we, we haven't had those same issues. Um, we're, we're trying to basically borrow from some different organizing patterns for how to do essentially risk management and trust generation that we're looking to nature basically to, to borrow from. So if it doesn't reach consensus, how, how does this uh, lend itself to different network participants being able to agree on something? Or as you said, that trust, how do we know what's truth or does it not really matter? We're trying to lend this to different applications. Well, so one thing I'll point out is you're able to generate a shared perspective without having a global, a single global perspective. So you and I are able to come to some shared agreement about our mutual history, let's yeah. say, without having every other participant in the entire ecosystem also agree about you and I and our particular history. Yeah. So part of the, the thing that differentiates Holochain from other distributed or decentralized architectures is basically we are holding on to and recording information from the perspective of each participant. Uh, one of the things that blockchain and Bitcoin initially and blockchain later, uh, or as part of that, uh, were doing was trying to overcome basically Einstein's discovery from a hundred years ago that there is no universal ordering of events right? Yeah. They were trying to manufacture an agreed upon ordering of events for an entire community by basically having a commu that community every, in Bitcoin's example, every 10 minutes or so, agree that this person's perspective, you know, Jimmy's the, the winning miner, his perspective is going to be the official perspective for the entire community, Right. And they came up with a mechanism for basically throwing away what everybody else had seen, their perspectives on the ordering of events and selecting one as the truth for the community. Yeah. Uh, we're not doing that. What we're doing is we're actually holding on to every participant's perspectives. And when I take an action, I'm then logging it in a hash chain, same data structure that blockchain is making use of. But it's a hash chain, not of everyone's activity, but of my activity. Right. So I do. I tweet. I tweet again. I tweet again. OK, it's ordering those that may not be so important in terms of tweets. It may be 
it may be more important in terms of transactions. You know, I send some money, I receive some money. Well, what order did those things happen in? Did I try to send money when I didn't have anything in my account? Yeah. In that case, ordering of events really matters. But we're then able to have participants come together and cross those perspectives. If you and I at some point do an, we have an interaction where I send you some money and you accept it, I send it, you accept it, something like that. We will have actions that have occurred earlier in my chain, previous in my history, and then actions that occur later in your chain. Somebody else coming and looking at those things together would be able to say, hey, we know that Matt's, this action that Matt took happened before this other action yep. that, that Alex took, right? And so you're able to generate consensus, but we're trying to generate local consensus in the places where it matters at points of interaction rather than global consensus uh, for all of the actors. So that's a description of what the nodes are doing versus proof of work, proof of stake. People are starting to get pretty familiar with that. It's recorded in a distributed hash table, you call it. And how do we... Um, get dispute resolution if me and five friends that are all dishonest nodes say alex did have that money um how do we prove to the network that that is untrue so yeah I'll, I'll, let's take a step back because dispute resolution is actually one step further than just hey there's something wrong here okay so <laughs> let's start with just hey there's something wrong here yeah. um how would you how would you indicate how would you figure that out well there's a couple of things one let's say you know I had paid you all of the funds in my account. And then I go and try to, to do that with somebody else. I try to essentially something akin to the double spend problem that blockchain confronts, right? Or, or is trying to face. So I then go try to spend with somebody else. A distributed hash table, we haven't talked about that so much. We talked about a local source chain. That's actually stored on the, on the user's own device. And every transaction that that user takes, they're signing with their own private key. It's the private key that they're using for that particular application. That's That doesn't mean that it's Matthew who's signing this, but you know that the person who's doing this action is the same party that did this previous one and this previous one and this previous one. So it serves, these public and private keys basically serve as a, as a foundation upon which we can build correlations between actions, which serve as basically the foundation of identity in any system. Okay. Um, you know, me, me being able to remember what you look like makes it so next time I can, you know, go, oh, this is the guy who's into cryptocurrency. Right. Um, long story short there, that's how the data is recorded initially. But then we're separately, we're sharing that out to the community and not everyone in the community is holding on to a copy of it, but certain parties are. That which certain parties is sort of random. It's semi-random in that it's deterministic because it's actually determined by the content itself. So in this transaction or in my tweet, if I hash that, if I take that and run it through a mathematical function called a hash function, it'll spit out a little digital fingerprint. That piece of content is going to go live with the nodes. The nodes are that are going to be responsible for it are nodes that actually have a hash of their public key that is close to that contents hash. So if this is a seven, blah, 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 it's going to go live with the ones that are seven, blah, 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 right? Not the ones that are three, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And it basically hops around the network trying to find the nodes that are closest to it. We didn't invent distributed hash tables. They've been around for decades. It's the core of BitTorrent. IPFS uses them as well. It's just an efficient way for you to be able to put content into a system and later be able to get it back out, even if every one of the machines that you handed it to originally has gone offline. Yeah. And what happens there is essentially nodes are talking to one another, going, hey, you got anything new? You got anything new? And if I reach out to some, my device reaches out to a neighboring device, a device that has a nearby address, not geographically neighboring, but neighboring in this hash space. And they don't hear anything back. I know we've lost someone. That's my cue to go recruit a new node to make some backups of the content. Okay. So it's a self-healing data store, essentially. Yeah. Okay, with all of that said, so I try to do this double spend thing. Well, that that both of those transactions are going to propagate into the network by me, or if I'm like trying to hold onto it, by you, by the counterparty to each of those transactions. You want the rest of the network to know about the fact that I sent you some money 
right? And so you start propagating that. Now, what you're propagating has my signature on it. It's me saying, yep, I'm going to do this thing. I'm sending this money. If I also sign another statement trying to essentially commit fraud, that becomes detectable in the network. When people go and look, they can, they can see, oh, wait a minute, this person's trying to spend stuff twice. Now, that doesn't tell you how to resolve it. Right now, the, you you mentioned dispute resolution. Yeah. That's a separate problem. The first problem is: do, were we able to detect that there was something bad happening here? Depending on the kind of application you're wanting to create, you would want to set up different mechanisms for preventing those kinds of frauds, or for uh, remedying them. Some some simple versions we're using for a application that does have currency as part of it, Holo hosting, that's separate from Holo chain. Okay. We're making use of notaries. We're making use of something called a header rollback protection. We're basically adding a couple of features which do add burden. They do add some cost. There's a little bit of extra work that's needed in those applications. Um, but they make it less likely that somebody's going to be able to get away with some kind of fraud. Another piece that we have available to us in that particular community is one, people aren't able to issue currency unless they've actually built up some reputation. We'll get into that stuff more in a bit, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but two, we actually need, because we're interacting with the banking system in that particular application, we need to do KYC, know your customer. So people actually have to show up with passports and things like that, which means, well, if you burn a bridge, if you commit fraud, that's it, right? Nobody's going to feel safe playing with you anymore. And it's not like you get to just manufacture a new identity very cheaply. You don't just spin up another node. Yeah. So there's a significant barrier to, uh, there's a cost to committing fraud. And that cost is basically a loss of access to doing, to interacting with that community anymore in the future. Cool. Especially if you combine that with the size of transactions typical in that application they tend to be very small wow you stole three pennies you know and yeah. now you don't get to play anymore yeah. probably not a good probably not a good choice okay cool i want to get into as you said just touched on then hollow chain versus the hollow cloud hosting that you guys are building so what what is the difference there and what other things do you want to build on top of hollow chain in the future sure so hollow chain is the general framework for building these peer-to-peer -peer applications uh, it's open source. We're giving it away for free. It doesn't have a business model. It is not a platform. It's a framework, right? It's like HTML. You, you can set up and design a Holochain app that's something like Slack where you can chat with some people on your team. We may never even know that it exists, right? It's just running on your own devices. Just like with HTML, if you write angle bracket, B, angle bracket, anybody else who's also making use of that same protocol is going to know, oh, make this bold. Well, similarly, Holochain is just a way to enable the members of a community to create data integrity for a distributed application. Yeah. Holo is a, is a service that is itself a Holochain app, but is designed to also serve Holochain apps. One of the problems that we identified in terms of, hey, trying to gain early adoption for Holochain is if people build an application in this new you know, distributed architecture, uh, it's only geeky tech adopters who are gonna use it initially. Yeah. That's not good enough for us, basically. We want anybody to be able to use it. Why? Well, because we want you, if you build a peer-to-peer -peer version of Uber, to not get punished for having built it on Holochain. Right? We want you to be able to serve that to anyone. You know, Matthew's grandfather, who's not going to be learning about cryptographic keys or you know, hardware wallets anytime soon, he knows how to go to a website. He knows how to type in a URL. And so what Holohost is its full name, what Holohost does is it enables members of a Holochain application to serve websites to visitors to basically enable outsiders to participate in that application, even though they are not full peers, even though they are not using their phone as both a user and a provider, 
right? Because yeah. when you're normally running a Holochain app, your device acts not just as a user, but it's also bearing some of the load for serving that application of storing content, validating content, and serving it to others. It's a really light burden. Uh, the the amount of work that your phone has to do if you were participating in a version of Twitter that had a billion users, for instance, over the course of a year, you'd probably have about one photograph worth of storage. Mm. Um, this is OG Twitter, you know, 140 character text messages. Yeah. But, you know, it's light, but nonetheless, your device has to do some work. With Holo, the issue is, well, if we have these folks that are accessing an application through the web, their device is not offsetting their use. We've got an imbalance there. Normally, your device basically pays your own way, right? So what we needed was for other people to be incentivized to show up and offset that use, to basically service those people. And what we created was a hosting marketplace. So the long story short is if I create an app, I want anybody to be able to access it. I can offer to pay members that are running my application to serve websites to ordinary folks on the web. When they do that little bit of work, I pay them in Holofuel, the crypto accounting system that we designed. Um, and yay, they get rewarded. The person gets served. I'm probably making money off of transaction fees or whatever the other the business model is for that particular yeah. application. And our business model is that we take a 1% or less transaction fee when people transfer Holofuel. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so one of the questions I do get is, you know, Ethereum does have a, a big head start. However, you guys have been around for a number of years, and I think you initially started as Meta Currency ten years ago, which is fantastic. So, what would you say yeah. to people that are looking for their platform or a framework to build apps upon? Um, how are you attracting developers and talent? Uh, mostly, it's functionality. To be honest, um, it, I, I'd say a lot of our uh, interest comes from people who've tried to build things on Ethereum or other blockchain platforms. And they realize, wow, this is great for raising money and not for anything that's actually computationally intensive, right? Things that are m amount goes from that account into this account. Well, as long as those are big amounts, I'm okay to run that program, right? For us, we did our, our initial coin offering, our initial community offering on Ethereum for Holo. That was an ERC-20 token. And I remember just adding names to a whitelist. It was, you know, something like a dollar for 60 names or something. That's crazy. You know, that's just add to list, mm. right? That's, that's not significant amount of computing. Um, and it was also slow and, you know, all the other problems. So people who are actually wanting to build things uh, that run in a decentralized or distributed manner, those folks are, are coming. Uh, a lot of what we've been trying to do is to make it easy. We're moderately successful at that so far. Yeah. Um, our, our prototype version was actually pretty darn easy to build apps in. Our newer version, which is built in Rust, is a little bit more difficult. Um, we're see as, as we had mentioned earlier, uh, or maybe we talked about this before we started recording. Yeah. We're seeking to uh, provide support for JavaScript and other super popular applications in the near future. Right now you're building apps in Rust. Uh, but that, that said, building apps in Rust means there's a small part of the application that is the Holochain data integrity layer that you're building in Rust, and then the other 90% of your app you're building in what other, whatever front-end language you want to use. Cool. So what are some of the more interesting apps that you've seen uh, in the pipeline? Oh, man. Um, I mean, we've seen everything from people who are actually trying to build peer-to-peer -peer Uber. There's a company called Arcade City based out of Austin, Texas, that's looking okay. to do that. Were they originally building on Ethereum? Yeah, I think they, I think Ethereum, yes. I remember hearing and, that back in the day, so I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, we've had everything from that kind of thing. We built our own peer-to-peer -peer version of Twitter uh, a while ago. That was kind of like one of our initial demo apps. It's not really Twitter. It's just... Yep. It was kind of a demo app. Uh, we've got everything from a uh, group Minesweeper. So this is like a team play Minesweeper app uh, called Miner Sweeper, where your the bombs are actually other coins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> shark um, pool. Shark pool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, what else? 
one of the ones that was actually one of my favorites was a peer-to-peer uh, -peer library app. Uh, somebody came to one of our hackathons. We've done hackathons all over the world at this point. We've got meetups in 70 cities around the globe. And uh, there was a gentleman from Sweden who lives in a, in a village of, I can't remember how many, I want to say like 900 people or something like that. Basically not a big enough town to afford to have a library. And he went, why can't, but we all have books, you know, why don't we just do like a peer to peer library? And so he wrote this little application called mail books <laughs> um, with an X at the end that, uh, that basically enables you to post what the books are that you have available for other people to borrow. And when people say, Hey, I want to borrow this, you just leave it in your mailbox cool. uh, and they can pick it up. And then when they return it, they say, Hey, I returned it. And you can say, yep, I, I got it. Now it's available for somebody else to borrow. Uh, but everything from that to peer-to-peer -to -peer electricity grids uh, to solutions for disaster relief. Um, because one of the nice things about Holochain uh, that comes out of not trying to do global consensus is it's okay if you have a network partition, right? If you have people that are on an island and that island loses access to the rest of the World Wide Web, mm. people can continue interacting they can send messages to one another. They could do monetary transactions with one another, et cetera, in that application. And later when the network heals and you gain connectivity to the rest of the community, all that information gets shared. Their accounts get updated, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that offline or network partition resilience is really important for a lot of use cases. And, and um, that is known yeah. as gossiping. Is that right? Where the, the network participants on that island, for example, are able to gossip amongst each other and then resync with the, the main network. Gossiping is, is a, a technically something that's happening at a particular layer. So gossiping is happening in terms of the, the backups of information. Okay. But, but if you and I were in a room and we had a Wi-Fi uh, or Bluetooth, we could do a transaction with one another. How that gets propagated across the network is through gossip. Okay. Basically, um, and and that but that might not happen until later, right? Until later when you come back into contact with other folks, which is totally fine, because whether or not our transaction happened at the same time as this one over here, that's not that's not important, yeah. right? This is kind of this sounds foreign when people are really, um, I think you deeply just, steeped you, in. You just get your head around proof of work and proof of stake and tangle, and then all of a sudden there's something else new. But I do love it. It's why we love this space. There's something new every day. Well, the, the one piece I'll say there, though, is when you're familiar with proof of work type stuff, it it literally gets you to think about decentralized systems as, as if they're centralized, yeah. right? But just think about email, right? You care which order you sent and received emails in. Yeah. You don't necessarily care about that order relative to somebody that you've never talked to and are never going to talk to on the other side of the world. We don't do a global ordering of emails, right? That's a distributed system. It's important for me to know, oh, I sent this and then I received something back from him. Okay, so I don't need to send a follow-up or I, so to make sure that he's gotten this thing. Like the ordering of emails matters to me, but it's from my perspective. It's not from some global perspective. Right, we will move on and take one of the questions we got from the audience, which was about the um, the token supply since the ICO um, and the future uh, total circulating supply. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on all that? Yeah, so the thing that people usually have a question about is two things. One, wow, there's 177 billion hot out there. Uh, why? Well, we're doing a micro payment currency, right? And we want to make sure that, uh, well, one, we think this is going to be widely used. Right? Long story short is if we, this currency is designed to support a particular thing, web hosting. Web hosting, oftentimes people go, well, is that much of a business? Uh, one, yes. <laughs> uh, Amazon Web Services is Amazon's web hosting yeah. business. Amazon's one of the largest companies on the planet. Amazon Web Services makes up more of Amazon's profits than everything else in the company combined. Yeah. Right. So it's the cash cow of one of the most valuable organizations on the planet. We're looking to do to Amazon's cash cow, what Uber did to taxis. Right? So that's the basic gist of Holo. Um, Holo's Holo fuel, the currency that we will be using as part of Holo is designed to be able to do high volumes 
of low value transactions. So we want to make sure that we can cover that. Yeah. Um, the other thing that people have problems with or questions around is that we've described in our white paper that we are going that holo fuel, not holo tokens, but the thing that holo tokens will be redeemable for, holo fuel will have a variable supply, meaning that that participants in the community, specifically hosts, will be able to uh, issue new holo fuel. What does that look like? That looks like I've been hosting for three months, four months, five months. I've established a really solid reputation for great uptime, uh, fast response, I'm on a good connection, yada, yada, yada. If the price of holo fuel starts to go up, I may decide to essentially pre-sell some of my hosting services, right? So I say, hey, I promise to deliver hosting in three days or in five days. I'll give a discount on that. And what that ends up doing is that's essentially an issuance of currency into the system, yeah. right? But whether or not people find that discount worth it is going to depend on whether they find me credible to deliver those services. And this is where we saw EOS having issues with trouble with like RAM and everyone is experimenting with the best way to, to do this really, aren't they? Mm. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, any final thoughts? I've really enjoyed that um, today, Matthew. It's given me some great insight because I, I do love projects like, um, you know, we've covered Golem and iExec and I think distributed computing, file storage, as you say, this is such a huge industry that's going to be disrupted from Amazon, Google, Microsoft. Yeah. Um, I guess the one last thought, and this is probably the other thing that drives a lot of people to be interested in Holochain. Holochain is designed from an agent-centric perspective, meaning we're trying to put the person in the middle, or at least the device in the middle, right? As opposed to the application or the platform in the middle. What that enables is bridging between application contexts. That one little bit of functionality, oftentimes people will ask me, what is, what is the killer app going to be, right? There's not going to be a killer app, I don't think. I think that functionality of bridging between applications, that's actually the killer app. That starts to open up some really interesting things, particularly in spaces like supply chains, where I may want to speak with my vendor in one particular way using one app, but then I can take that information that I receive and transform it and communicate it in a different app or build an automated pipeline for communicating with my warehouse manager about inventory control or something else, right? Or my customer about the availability of supply. So that agent centric piece is, I believe a game changer. I think it's going to really shift what, what we're able to do in terms of our abilities to communicate and coordinate in ways that are more effective in meeting complex challenges. Fantastic. Well, I do wish you guys luck with it all. I'm sure we'll have you back on the channel in future and I'll put the links in the description below and uh, hopefully we'll see you in Australia as well sometime. I know we'll be there next month. Oh, fantastic. Cool. Do, doing a series of events. Awesome. Well, thanks for tuning in, guys. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you.